Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this evening's webinar, The Cashback App, an exclusive conversation with Brian Leach, founder and CEO of Ibotta. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Wendy Maldonado D'Amico. I'm Yale College class of 1993, and I am a director of Accelerate Yale and Yale Angels. Our discussion this evening is co-sponsored by Yale Law School. Accelerate Yale is a global community of diverse alumni and friends of Yale engaged in innovation, tech, and entrepreneurship. Our mission is to cultivate an active, inclusive ecosystem that thoughtfully promotes meaningful connections and collaborations, while also serving as a bridge between alumni and current Yale students. Please note that we are being recorded this evening and all participants are muted. Tonight's session will be one hour and we will reserve the final 25 minutes for your questions. If you have a question you'd like to submit, please do so via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And now I have the pleasure of introducing our moderator as well as our featured speaker for this evening. First, our moderator. Gary Stewart is Yale College class of 1996 and JD 99 from the law school. He is the CEO and founder of Founder Tribes, an innovative app that gamifies founder education and provides access to mentors and fundraising. Until recently, he was the CEO and co-founder of The Nest, a mobile app that could be called a masterclass for founders. From 2014 to 2019, Gary was the director of Waira UK, a corporate accelerator backed by Telefonica. From 2010 to 2014, Gary was an associate professor of entrepreneurship at IE Business School in Madrid and CEO of Waira Spain. He launched his first startup in 2005. Before becoming an entrepreneur, Gary worked as a lawyer in the US, UK, and Spain. He graduated magna cum laude Phi Beta Kappa from Yale College and was the executive editor of the Yale Law Journal at Yale Law School. He is a governor of the University of East London and has been on the power list of the most influential black people in the UK. He is a member of the leadership teams of Accelerate Yale and Yale Angels. And now I'd like to introduce our featured guest this evening, Brian Leach, class of 2005 from Yale Law School. Brian founded Ibotta in 2012 when he realized the need for a more innovative approach to connecting brands, retailers, and consumers through mobile technology. Brian made it his mission to empower uh, smartphone savvy shoppers with an easy way to earn cash back on their everyday purchases. Today, the company is the industry leader in performance-based marketing in both offline and e-commerce environments. Ibotta's app has been downloaded more than 40 million times, and the company has paid back over $750 million in cash back, which has helped millions of people pay for life's necessities, such as healthcare, education, food, and shelter. Brian is a frequent commentator on mobile payments, mobile commerce, loyalty and rewards, and the financial technology sector. He has been recognized as a top 10 CEO in the United States, small, medium-sized businesses by glassdoor.com, CEO of the year by Colorado Biz Magazine, and EY Entrepreneur of the Year for the Rocky Mountain region. Prior to Ibotta, Brian was a partner at a leading law firm and served as a law clerk for Justice David Souter at the US Supreme Court. Brian is a graduate of Harvard, Oxford, and Yale Law School. He has reached the summit of Colorado's 58 tallest mountains, each over 14,000 feet in elevation. Brian is a member of the Board of Trustees at Colorado Academy. Brian, it's an honor for Accelerate Yale to host you this evening, and thank you so much for joining us. I'm now going to turn it over to my friend, Gary Stewart. Hey, thanks, Wendy, and thanks, Brian. Um, so, Brian, I'm going to start with you, uh, just the, the typical startup question. Um, please tell us who you are in one minute. Who is Brian Leach? What's your one-minute pitch? Yeah, uh, I was born in Nairobi to the son of an entrepreneur. I moved to the United States so my father could pursue his entrepreneurial dream. Grew up in Atlanta, watched him start his company as a storefront in the mall. Then I watched A Few Good Men and decided I wanted to be like Tom Cruise. Got the idea to go to law school. It turned out that practicing law wasn't quite like it was in the movie. 
after clerking and working as a lawyer for about four, five, six years, depending on how you count it, I quit to found a company called Ibotta, mobile technology company. My wife thought I was a little bit crazy, uh, just sort of stumbled into it, tried to figure it out, assembled a great team. Uh, it's now about a 700 person company. We're based here in downtown Denver. And it's just been a wild adventure having two careers, one in law and one in technology as an entrepreneur. Uh, I have a wife, Jen, who I met my first month in college 25 years ago. I have two daughters, 15 and 12 years old. Uh, they are fantastic parts of my life and better for worse. We just got a puppy in the middle of the pandemic. It's a cliche, but things weren't busy enough uh, focusing on taking the company to the next level. So that's me and a little bit about me. All right. And how would you describe Ibotta in one minute? What's your one minute pitch for Ibotta? Ibotta is the leading cashback rewards platform in the U.S. So whether you're buying bread, milk, eggs, cheese, diapers, beer, you name it, whether you're shopping on Amazon, at Walmart, in store, online, on your desktop, on mobile, we give you cash back for that purchase, like an instant rebate that you can put into your bank account or onto PayPal or a gift card. We've paid people now actually a billion dollars in cash back since I submitted my bio, uh, making us one of the most lucrative uh, cash back platforms in the world. Um, the company is has raised just shy of $200 million dollars we're at a stage where we're getting ready to go public and, and looking at what that next step would look like. And you know, we're just, a, we're people who have a mission, we're on a mission to make every purchase rewarding. Um, and so that mission is really influencing what people buy, where they shop and how they pay through the use of rewards. And you use the word mission. I mean, I guess it's kind of really inspiring that you were able to kind of do good and do well at the same time, meaning that you're actually helping people in a mission driven sort of way, but also making a lot of money. Can you tell us a bit about kind of what is Ibotta's mission in that sense? And how did you convince your investors to go along with the idea that life should be about more than just making money? Yeah, look, I mean, our view is that you have these businesses like Facebook and Google that give you something like free email or social media, and then they bombard you with ads that under, undermine or interrupt the fundamental experience. Then they take your data and monetize it with or without your consent. Huge scandal ensues, and now we have new rules. Our model is different. Our model is basically we ask consumers to share information about what they buy. That's why the company is called Ibotta, like I bought a bag of groceries. It's, it's, it's a bad pun. But basically, in exchange for that information, we give them something, we give them money. We cut them in on the deal so that when they respond to an ad, they benefit as well. Um, and when they share information, it's so that we can send them the most personally relevant um, deals. So it starts from a more ethical use of uh, opted in use of data. It starts from a different kind of idea of value exchange. And one of the reasons why I quit the, the law firm uh, after, after one year as a partner at the law firm just quit was that we were fighting over whether corporation or corporation A or B owned this patent or, you know, it just didn't have much moral relevance as I saw it. And this is a way to help uh, people in their everyday lives make ends meet. And the most direct way you can help someone is give them money. The cool thing about our model is that we're not a government agency. We're a for-profit company that makes money on each transaction, but we make enough money that we can still share back over a billion dollars during, uh, during the course of, of doing what we do. Yeah, and I think that you kind of hit on one of the points that's really interesting for me because it kind of resonates with you know, my journey as well. You had degrees from Harvard, Oxford, Yale, a Supreme Court clerkship, partner at a law firm. This is like for most people, the American dream. But then, as you said, after a year, you're like, well, this is not so awesome. I think like I want to give it all up, quote unquote, and become an entrepreneur. Tell us a little bit about that journey. Yeah, look, I mean, the first thing I have to say is that I come from uh, many, many concentric circles of privilege, whether it is, you know, educational privilege or a hundred other kinds of it, access to a network that gave me opportunities to, to pivot in the middle of my career. But I felt like going to a place like Yale gave me a chance to take that risk. I had an opportunity to know other people who could encourage me, who I met at Yale, a lot of them who invested in me. Uh, they had friends who I could get in touch with as angel investors. Nobody wanted to touch my company. We, I talked to 10, 15 venture firms. They all said no. I mean, I was pitching people in their basement with a PowerPoint, you know, living a double life, going around as a law partner and pitching a startup on the side for six or nine months. Uh, but I knew that I could fall back on my, my credentials and my 
resume and my privilege, frankly, and that gave me more courage to take that risk. Um, but I also think, though, that uh, the way that you learn to think about the world at Yale Law School, for example, surprisingly, I think, prepares you pretty well to do a lot of things outside the law. So I felt like I could do aspects of being an entrepreneur, even though I had no technical skills, I had no savings, I didn't go to business school, I had no idea how to build a financial model. There was a lot I obviously didn't know, but there were things that I could do. I could tell a story about the future because it felt just like being a trial lawyer. I could try to be persuasive and paint a picture, synthesize a lot of information and distill it into a point of view. So I tried to lean on my strengths and you know, I, I thought no matter what, it'll be an interesting adventure and I'll, I'll learn something. And I never really set out to achieve certain, you know, a specific financial goal. It was really just a life experience I wanted to have. And I guess maybe some of it was driven by the fact that your father, as you mentioned, was like a really successful entrepreneur himself. Like what I read was he grew this kind of computer store in Atlanta to a public listed company worth more than $1.2 billion in 2000. So what was it that you kind of learned from your father's entrepreneurial journey? I mean, my father's entrepreneurial journey was like everybody's entrepreneurial journey, crazy, chaotic, uh, you know, often depressing and also exhilarating. You know, it, it chewed up his marriage to my mother. That that's a difficult, uh, you know, difficult part of it. But the, the great part of it was he controlled his own destiny. He had his own team, his own work culture. They had a stand up. They they were all in together and rowing in the same direction. And that was inspiring to me. Um, and I watched them, you know, crash and burn. And I'll never forget watching my father on the nightly news up to his chest in water. And there were computers just floating around in the background. There had been a main valve burst at Perimeter Mall in Atlanta. And that was the day they got out of the direct-to-consumer business, cashed in their insurance check and started over as a B2B company. And, you know, 20 years into that, it was a huge success overnight. So I learned that there are a lot of times where you just want to give up and, and you know, the version of the brochure version that you read about as an entrepreneur is completely different than the lived experience. So to me, it was just good reality check on what it's really going to take to work your way to a position where you have some modicum of success. But my father was a person who was uh, always an optimist, always believed in the next big product they were coming out with and was good with people and a good seller. So I think that is honestly the, the thing is just like, I hate it when entrepreneurs come on sessions like this and they do what Justice Souter used to call paint the bullseye, where they, they've been randomly firing arrows into the air for the last decade. And then they, under cover of night, you know, go paint a bullseye around wherever the arrow happened to land and then pretend as though they were aiming there. That drives me nuts. So that's what was most important to me. And I mean, as you said, it kind of like, there are a lot of like personal costs a lot of times to entrepreneurship, but then your wife is an entrepreneur too. Like, how do you guys balance all of the like craziness and ups and downs daddy dad's a lawyer you know wife's a lawyer you're uh, sorry, uh, um, an entrepreneur you're an entrepreneur how did how did you how do you guys deal with all of that like you know uncertainty you know a uh, lot of ways to answer that question therapy comes to mind um, coaching uh, a glass of wine at the end of every day there are a lot of ways to answer that look my wife's a doctor she's trained as a doctor while I was starting my company we were able to rely on her salary. I took a 5x pay cut overnight when I resigned from my law partnership, but she was able to be stable and breadwinning for the, for the family. Then when Ibotta got to a place where I could pay myself better, uh, you know, she decided to start her own uh, medical clinic, which is she's a world expert in eating disorders and the medical side of eating disorders. Um, she is incredible. Her book has been translated into Japanese and Russian and she travels the world. So it is difficult juggling, um, you know, those two things because we're both passionate about our work and we're parents and we want to be good parents to our daughters who we want to also inspire. So it's definitely challenging, but we've been together for 25 years. And part of it is that we just communicate through it. When I was starting Ibotta, we, we played a game called um, uh, Flag Stake Boulder. And that's where you basically identify the flags, which are light preferences. Like I prefer to shop at full Whole Foods for my fish because it's slightly nicer. Uh, a steak, like I really think it's important for our children to travel and experience foreign cultures. And a boulder, like this is non-negotiable. We have to stay in this house. We have to be able to pay this mortgage payment so our kids can go to the local public school. And what we realized was the only boulder was staying in the house. The rest were just flags and stakes. So as long as I could make 
you know, enough money to pay the mortgage that this was a decision that we both could support. So we, we used a framework like Flagstick Boulder to make it less binary when we were going to make a major career decision and really get to yes on that. And that's, that's that plus taking every year we took the 26th of December to the 1st of January, and just the two of us went to the mountains. And we just talked about, you know, self-care, what we wanted personally and professionally. We'd go on a long snowshoe and it'd be like, I want to leave my I want to leave my uh, hospital and start a clinic. It's like, okay, let's figure out how to do that. And so I think just, you know, and then the encouragement of one person taking the leap and the other person being like, I can do that. Um, it's sort of infectious, honestly. And I was going to ask you, I mean, you kind of maybe answered this question, but when you were at the law firm, like, was there a moment where you were like, now is the time to quit? Like, how did you come to the conclusion? Because a lot of people have, you know, this fantasy but it's just like living in their head. How did you go from the fantasy to the reality of I'm giving this up? I kind of came out to myself that I wasn't really happy as a lawyer. Um, I had sort of had this brass ring resume, I'll put for the Supreme Court, Yale Law School. Uh, and so everybody would be like, wow, you have a great legal career. But the dirty little secret was I loved trying cases and oral arguments, but research and writing was just deathly boring to me. It wasn't extroverted enough. It wasn't varied enough. It was too analytical. It wasn't creative enough. And so I decided to be honest with myself. I don't, I don't want to measure out my life in coffee spoons like this the next 20 years. So I've got to do something. And once you say that out loud, it's like, wow, now I've said that and told people that I'm not happy. I'm at a crossroads. I have to come up with something. And I think for me, I was at a conference in Rio on international arbitration. And I was at this conference and realizing I'm essentially monolingual resident of Denver, Colorado, trying to build an international arbitration practice. You don't need to know a lot about international arbitration to know that that's not a winning formula. So on the flight on the way back, I saw someone taking a picture of her receipt with her phone. And I'm like, that's interesting, you know, taking a picture, getting a record of everything you bought. And that led to the idea for Ibotta. And there are about 20 other ideas that were truly terrible, but you know, it's just, it's just deciding that you're not going to be the person who's 50 years old and wondering what might have been and, and feeling a sense of regret that, you know, the fear of failure was outweighed by the sense of just deep regret that I knew I would feel if I didn't give it a shot. And I guess, you know, that's really brave. Um, but a lot, there's a lot of judgment that comes from other people, because I remember like one of the things uh, I, that you said when I first met you was, you know, like, even though you had you know, been a Supreme Court clerk and a partner and all that kind of stuff, like going to your first reunions afterwards, you felt like a sense of, it's not shame, but that people were like, that guy's a weirdo. Like, um, tell us a little bit about kind of like the, you know, the ostracization that you might've felt like coming out to yourself, as you said, and deciding, actually, I spent all this time and money on a law career, but that's not what makes me happy and I'm gonna do something else. And how did you overcome that over time? Yeah, you do feel like a little bit of an idiot when you spend that much money and have that much educational debt, and then you're kind of going in a totally different direction that you could have gone in without a degree. But a couple of things. First of all, uh, it's not true. The time I spent at Yale and Yale Law School, especially, it did help me. It did prepare me. It got me better. It wasn't business school. It wasn't being an entrepreneur, but it was still helpful working in small group settings. You can build on that. And so I didn't regret the money or the time I had spent. And clerking at the Supreme Court, which is a cool experience. And I didn't regret having that experience. I felt a little old relative to other people who founded companies, which I know sometimes happens because there's this myth of like the 18 to 20 year old founder. Um, there are some of those, but a lot of people do found companies and are successful in their, later in their lives. I think the more decisions you make that are unconventional or that are not approved by the Ivy League, you know, sort of orthodoxy, the more you make more of them. So for me, when I was clerking at the Supreme Court and someone suggested that I move to Denver, Colorado, the look I got from the other Supreme Court law clerks was like, oh, that's so sad. He had so much talent. He's going to go do horse and gas law and, you know, we'll probably never hear from him again. It was just very much like, whoa, these aren't the, one of the five sanctioned cities where you can live in and build a respectable career. Well, then you move to Colorado and you're like, this is awesome. 300 days of sunshine. I live 10 minutes from where I work. I have access to the mountains. I can climb 14ers. The joke's on everybody else. So when you do that and it works out, then you're like, huh, I wonder if I start something else, how would that go? And maybe, you know, throwing the keys away to the, to the castle of law is easier when you've seen the pinnacle of law and been like, meh, if this isn't exciting, trying cases, clerking for the Supreme, this is not what I should be doing. 
So I just, I didn't, I never had a single day where I wondered what it might've been as a lawyer. I've had plenty of days where I feel inadequate as a founder or a CEO, but I never, I never look backwards. I just am trying to, you know, watch out for the next giant pothole, <laughs> which happens daily. Yeah. And speaking of potholes, I mean, you kind of mentioned it in the introduction, but when you decided to do this, you'd never run a company before. Uh, you weren't an expert in mobile technology. You hadn't previously built a reward system. So how did you overcome this kind of lack of domain expertise? And how did you do it as a solo founder? Yeah, that that, that was hard. I mean, I, I just sort of took like the approach that I would, um, I would just start asking stupid questions and then I would get answers. And eventually I would ask a slightly more intelligent question. And then I would formulate an opinion and assert it. And if no one pushed back on it, <laughs> maybe it was true. Um, I went to my network at Yale. There was a guy called Thomas Lehrman who ran a group that had a network of experts. And I got a few free hours of consulting out of that network and was able to talk to someone who'd been at Coca-Cola or at Walmart or at AC Nielsen and just ask like a hundred dumb questions <clears throat> in a very safe space, safe space. And that allowed me to formulate my, <coughs> excuse me, my point of view on the industry. And then it's just, it's just trial and error. I mean, anyone who tells you they know exactly what consumers want when it's a brand new technology, maybe, maybe if they're Steve Jobs, but more often than not, it's just, it's iteration, it's trial and error, it's experimentation. And, and then, you know, you look back and some things worked and a lot of things didn't work. And I think I just have an appetite for, for absorbing new information that a lot of uh, people who go to Yale and, and lawyers in general, that's one of the skills that they have. And then if you find other people that do know the industry, I hired a guy who worked in CPG consulting and a guy who built a mobile app. I was able to figure it out from them. I mean, I, that's how you learn how to build a product. You don't learn it in law school. So I think you just, you just sort of fall forward enough times. And then one day you're like, wow, I'm, I'm actually doing this. I guess it's like learning a language or learning piano or learning anything. And did you ever think about getting a co-founder or did investors sort of ostracize you because you didn't have a co-founder and why oh, yeah. didn't you have one? Oh yeah, I definitely got ostracized for having no technical ability, not putting any of my own money into the deal, not knowing how to build my own business model, not having any, any intellectual property, living in Denver, Colorado. You know, sad, sad for Brian. I'm also a white male who went to Harvard, Oxford and Yale. Like I had advantages and I had disadvantages. Um, for me, I didn't want a co-founder because I felt like it was my idea. I was going to be able to raise the money and then I would have a first employee. So instead of giving somebody half the company right up front, I'd give them five or 6% of the company. And I was enjoying being, you know, the idea person and I needed someone to build and, and riff. And I've, that's just, to me, it wasn't, um, it wasn't really possible for me to quit right away and co-found something anyway, because I, pro tip, don't do this. I borrowed money from my law firm to buy my house when I took my job. So I actually couldn't leave until I made enough money to pay back my law firm. So I had to wait until my bonus was paid, pay off the law firm. And then I traded my law school debt to my in-laws for equity in the company so that I could get out of my law school debt. I mean, you know, I had a lot of debt and I, I needed to find creative solutions to figure it out. And I needed some time to work through that. And I raised money from 51 angel investors because not a single institution would touch me for the reasons you said, they all passed on Ibotta. Had they invested, they'd be up 50 to 100 X right now, but they all passed. Every single one of them on Sand Hill Road in, in Silicon Valley in New York City, they passed. And that was brutal ego bruising process, but it also led to a way better outcome of having a broad base of really motivated investors. And you and I had a conversation, I remember soon after we met the first time about like, how did you go about raising that first round using your network? Can you maybe tell us a little bit like, what are the tips when you can't raise institutional money to using your network to raise an angel round? I mean, scrappy, just get scrappy. I built a deck, I built a one pager. I, I just, I worked my network. I called people I knew in law school. I called people in grad school. I called people on boards that I had sat on. I had to make sure they were accredited investors, meaning they made enough, you know, 300 and, $300,000 a year for the last three years, or I don't know the rules, you know, different rules for trusts and so forth. But I found accredited investors who tended to be law partners, private equity people investing in their personal capacity, doctors, people just looking for a, a potential 50 to 100x outcome 
but who didn't mind having an illiquid investment. They were going to invest 50 grand or 100 grand and forget about it. Like it just never existed. People on Wall Street, for example, who you don't get a lot of this deal flow, you know, when you're when you're just a professional, but you have cash. So I called my roommates, I called my friends and, you know, they some of them invested 10 grand, some of them invested 100 grand and a bunch of people passed. And then what I found was once you got to a critical mass, it was like everybody wanted to come in because this thing was happening. You always want to be the last one in on the deal. And all the other names of the people who had come in on the deal were helping persuade the later people. Then I went to go tell my law firm I was quitting and the founder of the law firm who I expected to kind of be kind of upset with me because I had gotten all this training and tried all these cases, he paid me a bonus to come out to Colorado and, and be part of his law firm. Um, he's like, cool, can I be, can I put in a million dollars? Like, yes, Fred, that'd be amazing. So, you know, and that was a break that happened two days after I lost a million dollars from a guy I thought was going to invest. So, you know, you just don't jump off any bridges, right? The number of times you just want to completely quit is like two to three times a week in this job. So it's just hang in there and keep showing up. People tell people, you know, if a guy calls me up and says, can I have 15 minutes of your time? My name is Alston. Buddy of mine's putting in 50 grand in your company. And I'm like, sure, Alston, let's talk. I'm getting groceries, putting them in the cart. Two weeks later, I get a, 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 a it was like a, an email. Mr. Gardner would like to make his first investment in your company. Could you please send the wire instructions? And I'm like, that dude from the 15 minute conversation in the grocery store? He won't, okay, I'm expecting it's gonna be like $10,000. Dude uh, wires me $300,000, you know? And I'm like, what? Uh, you know, and, and this is after a bunch of people had just pulled out. So, you know, you just keep putting one foot in front of the next is the best advice. And then psychologically, you have to pretend as though this thing is a hot shit investment and it's oversubscribed and, you know, the train's leaving the station and it's FOMO. Even if you're holding two seven off suit, you got to project that you're holding, you know, pocket aces. And so it's not, you know, you don't go to a Sand Hill Road investor, at, at, you know, in Silicon Valley and say, Hey, you know, when would you like me to come back out the next time? I'd love to come back out next Monday or maybe the Monday after you just like, look, I'm talking to seven or eight funds. There's not going to be a problem filling out the round. It's really a question of who's the best strategic fit. If you're in, let me know by next week. It's like that confident kind of poker approach that I completely did not appreciate when I was starting out. And then, I mean, it's obviously been, obviously been successful because now you've raised $175 million, I think, and the company's worth more than a billion dollars. So what's the difference between pitching to those angels and then pitching to institutional investors? Totally different. I mean, angel investors want to hear the story. They want to get excited about you and the team. They want, they're not going to negotiate that hard with, with uh, you know, the specific terms and they're going to get a way more founder-friendly term sheet. And they may want to put in, yeah, sometimes you can say the minimum is 25 grand or 50 grand, or you can say, as long as they're accredited investors, you can say it's less, but you're going to have to typically put together, you know, maybe a few of those checks if you're trying to raise $3 million, like we were in the first round. Um, when you're raising money from a venture firm, like a, like a GGV Capital or a, a, a Coke Disruptive Technologies, which wrote a, a huge check for us, um, a different approach to diligence, you're going to get a lot more detailed questions about your cohort data or your, you know, those tend to be appropriate for, for later stage companies. But if you're investing from an institution very early on, they might have different questions for you. They might want to see that you have a prototype, that you've gotten some traction, you have a few paying clients. They might want to see whether you've been in an incubator like Techstars or whether you're working with a proven co-founder. I hadn't done any of those things. So I wasn't a good fit for institutional investors. And I, I, you know, I literally was, I was trying a case in, in uh, China. I was representing an oil company in China. And during my lunch break in Beijing, I would just <laughs> go pitch my little side hustle technology company to some venture capitalists who were in a high school and who showed up in suits in a high school because, you know, technically venture capital runs differently in a communist economy. And, you know, I'm just like pitching this thing and then getting back in a cab and going and representing Conoco. I mean, that, I was going to be flying to Atlanta, going to some dude's basement who used to work with my dad. And he got like all his rich friends to come over. And I'm like, all right, who's in? I mean, that's that's the scrappiness that that it took. And then you mentioned it uh, that you kind of raised money from the Koch brothers. And I read an interview where you said, uh, 
one of the three people that you'd like to meet would be Obama because you admire everything about him. So I'm assuming that kind of your politics may be a little bit different from the Koch brothers. Tell us a little bit about kind of how that came about and was it a tough decision taking money from people that you may not agree with politically? Yeah, look, so first of all, the phrase Koch brothers is like this whole charged phrase that implies, you know, the political uh, efforts of David Koch and Charles Koch. I took money from Koch Disruptive Technologies, which is the multi-billion dollar you know, investment arm of Koch Industries, which is the second most profitable private company in the United States. That is an amazing experience. That company is just incredibly well run, uh, learning about how to manage a team, set compensation structures. They own a company like Georgia Pacific, which is one of our largest clients. Um, so just the, the skill that, that you learn from them and how to run businesses better, um, and they really separate the politics. I mean, I was very fr upfront. I'm like, look, I'm I'm a pretty big believer in government regulation for purposes of climate change. You guys don't seem to be. Let's let's you know, are we aligned on the mission of Ibotta? We're aligned on your work on criminal justice reform. No, 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 no organization has done more for criminal justice reform than Coke Industries. We're aligned on a number of other things in, in terms of economic opportunity uh, for people, but. We're not aligned on, on certain other topics, campaign finance reform, for example. Yeah, the role of government, right? There they're tend to be more hands-off libertarian uh, conservatives, and I tend to be a little bit more pro the role of government. But in my experience, you gotta get over your own uh, personal ego stuff. And you're, you're a steward of the mission of your company, and you are a fiduciary of your shareholders. And so if the best opportunity for your mission and your shareholders is a company that wants to give you $200 million of patient capital and wants to see you grow to five or 10 billion, then you gotta take that. And that was how I approached that. And honestly, flying to Wichita and meeting with Charles, one of the most interesting things I've done in business. I wouldn't trade it, it was pretty cool. He's an incredible guy who's got an incredible work ethic and incredible family. And his son who runs KDT has done a really good job at that. And so now when you look back, I mean, it's been what, like 10 years or something like, what do you think have been the keys to Ibotta's success? Um, I think, you know, honestly, just just dogged persistence is the biggest thing. Just, you know, uh, there's there's a great book called The Hard Thing About Hard Things, uh, if you haven't read it. Uh, and one of the things that that the author talks about, uh, Horowitz talks about, is what he calls these whiffio moments that we're effed, it's over. Uh, and you have these feelings, these whiffio feelings a lot when you're starting out. And unless you're just lucky and you know you, you just catch lightning in a bottle, but that's not typically what happens. It's really about just persistence, the willingness to evolve your business, to think critically, to change directions, to iterate your product, to, to get people to hang in there through a pandemic when you have to lay people off. I mean, that is hard. Um, and I think it's just having belief in yourself, belief in your process and saying, look, win, lose, or draw, I'm gonna give it everything I have and I'll advance the mission as far as it can be advanced. And if it can't be that this is a profitable, great high growth company, then it can't be, you know? And I think the, ment the mental health side of that and the emotional support side of that is so critical and no one ever talks about that. Uh, I really, really feel strongly that it is, um, it is not some genius insight that someone had three years ago that's been the key to Ibotta success. It's relationships, with your partners, relationships with your, your employees, um, and then just understanding who you are and what you're good at. It turns out I'm not that good at lots of things that CEOs do, and I'm good at other things. And so how do I gravitate toward the things I'm good at and then just delegate and surround myself with people who can do all the things that I'm no good at? And I think that's, unless you're just a, you know, either delusional egotist or, you know, the only person I've ever met who's equally good at everything, you, you have, it's about self-awareness and then about basically focusing on the things that, that you're uniquely good at. And I think generally we've done that at the company over time. And I mean, one of the things that's really interesting is the mental health question. Like, how do you keep yourself grounded? Like when you're going through all of these ups and downs, I mean, what are the tips that you would have for founders who, you know, may not have kind of the full network or privilege that you have that are going through these ups and downs and kind of just like going crazy, their relationships are being affected. Like what would your advice be to those founders? Just hang in there. You're not by yourself. You're not alone. Your experience is not atypical. If you're having a hard, a hard time raising money, if you're having a hard time finding angel investors, borrowing money, finding your technical co-founder, this is hard. <laughs> this is hard. And there's nothing wrong with you. You're not doing it wrong. 
um, just believe that you know if you keep if you keep getting after it, there will be a moment of grace. There will be a moment where you get clarity on, and it might be that the current path isn't the right path, but it will become clear what you can do to head in the right direction. And if you're willing to work hard and be open-minded, then you know be patient and it will happen. That's the best advice I can give. I mean, I started out, I didn't have a coach. I didn't have a therapist. I didn't really think about mental health. I have all those things now. Uh, I have a whole restaurant that is reserved just to go to when my wife and I need to talk through the stressful times in our business. We have a particular restaurant for that conversation. That's how often that happens. So yeah, look, I mean, I think the other thing is just um, surround yourself with people. If you try and do it by all by yourself, you will break down. You will break down under the sense of pressure to your shareholders, pressure to your stakeholders. You have to diversify. The It can't just be that success is everybody's success and the problem is your problem. If that's how you think and you're a perfectionist, you're going to drive yourself nuts. So I would leave that advice out there as well. Awesome. And then I think one of the other things is, you know, you had the additional pressures you mentioned before of not being in San Francisco or even New York. And I see that, and we've seen here that you're kind of a firm believer in go where you want to live, not necessarily where people think it's cool. Um, and in Colorado, what I've read is that you've donated $3 million of your own money to construct the LEAD Center for Performing Arts, because you're a former actor as well. You support some uh, entrepreneurs with something called Pivot to Colorado, which is trying to attract talent from Silicon Valley to Denver. Like, what tips would you have for founders who kind of feel pressure to go to kind of San Francisco or New York because there's a lot of money there, but they really want to live somewhere else. And I guess maybe a follow-up to that question is, do you think that this has all changed now that COVID has made remote working a lot more? Completely changed, completely changed. I don't care if you want to work in Bozeman. I don't care if you want to work in, you know, Park City, if you want to work in, yeah, Boulder, Austin, you know, uh, Knoxville, you definitely can. You are going to have to get on an airplane, maybe even not now, but you probably will end up getting on an airplane and talking to some people in New York and San Francisco when it comes time, Boston, when it comes time to fundraise. Maybe you'll do it via Zoom. I mean, all the IPOs are happening via Zoom now. All the road shows are happening via Zoom. I don't see why you couldn't raise a series C or A or B or C entirely via Zoom. As long as you can attract talent in your, in your area, you're fine. And that of course, you can do that through remote work. Now, I don't think that remote work is right for every company. So I do think that the talent ecosystem where you're based is important from a business perspective. But let's just set business to one side, right? There's, there's the things that really matter in life, what, what David Brooks calls the eulogy virtues, not the resume virtues, the things that you actually talk about when someone dies. And those are things that relate to how you spend your time. For me, climbing to the top of the 58 tallest mountains in Colorado is far more important than anything that happens at Ibach. It's just far more important to me. Right? Spending time with my daughter at the top of a mountain, feeling the perspective that that gives me, being in nature, being able to go you know, paddleboard or whatever it is I like to do to clear my head, that's important. So start by closing your eyes and imagining the community you want to be part of. Maybe it's a religious community. Maybe it's a, a racially diverse community. Maybe it's a politically progressive or conservative community. Start by figuring out where you will live and what you value and what you want to spend your actual life doing. And then trust that because you went to Yale, you can figure out a way to do what it is you need to do in that community. Everyone starts out the opposite. They go and they're like, banking. I got to do banking or private equity or I got to be a corporate lawyer. Because someone tells them that's the like brass ring path to do out of Ivy League. And then you end up having where you live and how you live entirely dictated by what you're doing. So you're, you know, in DC or New York or Boston or Chicago, but there are so many places. I mean, Colorado has 300 days of sunshine. There are 6 million people in the whole state. I can drive three hours and I can be in Aspen where I can do 50 different things that are amazing, right? So I wouldn't trade living in Colorado for anything. So I would definitely encourage people to take advantage of the post-COVID environment and come live in a cool spot that's really consonant with your values or live in London and, and live wherever you want to live. And then what's, what do you, where do you see yourself in the next 10 years? I mean, I guess you kind of mentioned, you know, that you could be pre-IPO. Yeah, where do you see, you see yourself in the next 10 years? And do you imagine yourself continuing with Ibotta? Or is there some point at which you say, I think I've done my thing. It's time to now pass the reins on. Well, first of all, they have to be willing to continue to employ me. I don't want to be the arrogant guy who's like, well, and then I will, you know, I mean, 
I have a job because I'm currently viewed as a good steward of the mission of Ibotta and the board thinks that the founder should still be the CEO. There may well come a moment where I'm not the best person to lead the organization. If we're a you know X billion dollar publicly held company and we've got challenges on the horizon that I'm not the right person to solve, then I may get tapped on the shoulder and encouraged to move on. That's the first thing to know. If it's up to me, I have unfinished business that I'm very passionate about pursuing at Ibotta. I believe that we're about to have an explosion of impact on the world in terms of making every purchase rewarding. I believe that I'm uh, challenged, you know, I'm growing, I'm learning things. My daughters are 15 and 12. Until my 12 year old's 18, I pretty much have to be in Denver because she's in school. So I'm sort of saying during that period of time, I wanna get as much as I can, learn as much as I can win, lose, or draw from this stage of my career. But I also want to be able to do the things in Colorado that are important to me. Um, there's, there's experiences that I want to have with my wife, you know, here and all around the world that are important to me. So there will come a time where the eating disorder patients and the people interested in loyalty and rewards are going to have to wait. I got to go take my wife to some memorable experience that is I'm going to be thinking about you know, on my deathbed a whole lot more than, you know, the third quarter of 2023 at Ibotta. So, you know, I, I, I'm interested in, I've been here nine years. I'm enjoying it, learning and growing and um, fortunate that I've been able to do this. And I think uh, from, from what I could do from here, I'm not sure. I could start another organization, company. My current fantasy is starting a recording studio in Aspen and inviting the world's best recording artists to come uh, make music there and, and being part of the, the music production process. Not to make money, just because I, I like music <laughs> and I like Aspen. And so those are the kinds of things that I, I daydream about. They're not like, you know, putting another zero on my net worth or whatever. And my last question before I turn it over to Wendy is um, if there are Yaleys out there that kind of want to follow your unconventional path, uh, what would your advice be to them? Just jump off the diving board. I mean, when I started Ibotta, I had three goals and I wrote them down so I wouldn't you know, move the goalposts on myself. Goal number one was actually do it. Don't chicken out. Actually quit your job at the law firm and, and take the plunge, right? Because that's, that's really hard. It's easy to, to, to give up. And sometimes you should give up. And there's a question in the chat. We can talk about how you know whether your current idea is the right idea. But take the plunge was number one. Number two was do this for long enough that I could plausibly claim to be an entrepreneur instead of having to go tuck tail and go back to the law firm. So that was like a year, year and a half. Well, it'd be credible. And number three was try not to lose everybody their money. So if I could at least give their money back, be like, well, sorry, you didn't make any money, but here's the principal back. Those are my three goals. That's it. It wasn't build a unicorn. It wasn't hundreds of employees. It wasn't blah, blah, blah. Those are the goals. <laughs> And it was like, just learn and grow and, and understand who you are. And it's so easy to forget how, how much the goals have shifted because now it's, well, unless this happens, then I'm not going to be happy. And we do that to ourselves. Don't do that to yourself. Just take the plunge and try to focus on the intrinsic value of the experience or the mission that you're on rather than the outcomes from a financial or whatever the world is telling you, you know, this is the list of muckety mucks in Colorado who can buy the Broncos. Like, okay, who cares? And if you can get into that headspace and sort of enjoy it for its own sake, I think you'll take that risk and you'll trust that you went to Yale and you have your network and you will probably, you know, because of that opportunity and that privilege, be okay, no matter what happens. Awesome. Well, thanks, Brian. Now I'm going to pass it over to Wendy for the audience Q&A. Sure. Thank you. What a great discussion. So uh, we have lots of great questions uh, coming in through the chat. Thanks, everybody. Uh, and I know Brian's been spying on the chat, which is great. Uh, I, I must uh, take the first question from Anastasia, who asks, what makes, uh, why, why are lawyers good entrepreneurs? Uh, what is it about, about that education that creates a, an entrepreneurial mindset? Yeah, the, the conventional wisdom is that, uh lawyers are terrible entrepreneurs. I get it. Lawyers are risk averse. They adhere to precedent. Entrepreneurs are disruptive. But let me tell you, being a trial lawyer is about one main thing, which is two main things, synthesizing a lot of information and forming a point of view, and then telling a persuasive story about what happened. So I've got a version, other, the, the woman on the other side's got a version. We're going to tell that version to the jury and whoever's version wins, wins. I mean, we're seeing it right now with the 
the Chauvin trial, right? Synthesizing information, telling a story about how the facts fit together and, and what conclusion you should reach. An entrepreneur does exactly the same thing. Synthesize a lot of information about the market, the competitive landscape, the business opportunity, tell a persuasive story, but it's about the future, not the past. You're telling about where the puck is heading, what solutions are needed, how you're gonna make money, how you're gonna situate in the competitive landscape, but you're doing exactly the same thing. Writing is a valuable skill in business. It's very, it's, it's not, most people in business are not good writers. Uh, people in law school, they're good at that. So I think you, you can take a lot of the basic skills, problem solving, analytical ability. Uh, you, it's all persuasion. I'm either, I'm persuading you to join my company. I'm persuading you not to leave my company, to invest in my company, to partner with my company, to, to, to help advise me as a mentor. There's just, if you're, if you're a generally sort of good listener, good, good at working in small groups, good at persuasion, you'll be successful in business. So I think lawyers can make great entrepreneurs. Thank you. We have a lot of tactical questions from early stage founders here. So I'm going to kind of run through a, a few of them. Um, one question from Pian Pian is uh, what you think are, are some of the best things that early stage founders should spend their time on um, to make sure that they actually have a viable business? Yeah, look, I mean, this is the hard part is that a lot, a lot does come down to the idea. I, it's, fas it's fashionable to say, oh, the ideas are worth a dime a dozen. It's like, no, actually it does matter because you're gonna spend your life on this idea and on this dissertation. It's like picking a thesis topic that you end up concluding is kind of a, eh, not the greatest topic. I, I've done this, so I know. Um, I think that you, you just wanna make sure that you've really vetted the idea that there is a demand for your service, that there's a way you could make money. It's not just a flashlight app that's a cool utility, but there's someone who will pay for it You've talked to that someone. I think it, a good rule of thumb is if you can't find uh, either angel investors or institutions to invest in you and you've gotten you know, an at bat, it probably means that you have the wrong idea. At some point, you should be able to persuade smart people to see what you see. And if they don't see it, then that's, that's a, a throw it back and try another one. When I started, I bought it. It was about the seventh or eighth, eighth idea I had. A lot of the other ideas seemed good, but then the market was too small or people were like, eh, I'm not really into that. I talked to 20 people. They're like, eh, I don't need a safety recall notification service. I don't think we need a separate LinkedIn for doctors. I don't think we need a separate mint.com tool for Mac. I mean, these were all terrible ideas, but I thought they were hot shit for, for a minute or two. So you just have to learn how to cycle somewhat manically through these ideas until you hit on one. People are like, huh. I could see that. And when like five or six people say that who you trust, then you're like, well, maybe I should spend more time digging into this. And you can get two weeks into something and then be like, meh, it's already out there or you know, whatever. You just, you gotta have the energy to continue to kind of go back to the well on your next idea. That's what I would say. Great. Um, Jonita wants to know how you recruited your team. Um, you know, you have all these different needs as you're building your company. You need a great CTO, you need great design, you need great sales. How did you go about that process? Because let's face it, you were tra trained as a lawyer. Yeah, gradually and, and haltingly. I mean, I spent probably the first six day, 60 days. I raised $3 million and I'm putting it into the bank, you know, $25,000 check at a time. And this guy must've thought I was a drug dealer because I'm like, there's another 25 grand. <laughs> you know, and I've got $3 million and I'm sitting in the front room of my house and I have absolutely no team whatsoever. So I'm, you know, posting on Harvard Business School job board. Anyone want to move to Colorado? You know, posting on the, the, the tech co-founder groups in town. And just, it's like dating. You just got to kiss a lot of frogs, you know? So I'd interview people and, I, you know, I was lucked out, frankly. I found my chief technology officer. His, his brother called me and said, do you want us to do your, your work as a dev shop? And I'm like, no, I need a full-time guy. He's like, what about my brother? Like, all right, let's have pizza with your brother. And I pried him out of his other job. And, and then he hired a bunch of great people. So, you know, some of it's luck, some of it's just reps. I've also made a ton of terrible hires. And over time, you sort of figure out uh, that's, that's a risk factor for a bad hire. So I think there's no magic to it. It's just elbow grease. Okay. Um, so there are a few questions around financing. Um, one question is around, uh, just when, when you're approaching investors and someone says, you know, how much have you raised so far? And, and 
you know, they, they might want to see some detail behind your deck and, and your presentation. So uh, John wants to know, how did you answer that question of how did, how much have you raised so far? And, uh, you know, that, that request for detailed, uh, a detailed plan. Yeah, so this is very different when you're in the early stages of the company, because I think what John might be getting at is kind of like, can you, you know, it's chicken and egg, right? Yeah. So you're sort of like, well, look, we've, we've got 20, you know, 200,000, 2 million, 20 million committed. Committed is sort of one of those verbs, right? It's like soft circled. It's circled. It's very <laughs> lightly circled in pencil. You know, I mean, you have to remember that you're, you are thriving at the edge of credibility. If you go over the edge, that's bad, but you also have to be right up at that edge. And that's kind of a good working definition of being an entrepreneur, especially early days. You're, you're selling a vision, right? And so I would say, look, the, you know, we've got about a million and a half soft circled. You know, there was not an escrow with a million and a half dollars sitting there, but I felt, you know, I could represent that we had about that many commitments. And then you kind of get enough and then all the money is like, oh yeah, okay, this is happening. Oh, you got Larry Sansini. Oh, you got Jim Clark. Oh, I want him, right? So it's it's a little bit of creating this, this trains leaving the station feeling. And so you're going to take, not, not liberties, but you're going to define it. You're going to use the right words to define it. You, you know, um, I think that when it comes to later stage, you know, it's it's in crunch base. You're like, well, we've raised $25 million. You know, up to this point, we've raised $175 million. So that's not as much of a, I think early on though, you are trying to create this impression of momentum. And sometimes you can have an advisory board or you could have, there's other sort of ways you can get validation from people that, that may help give somebody some comfort. They're, they're looking for heuristics, right? Like, oh, that guy invested. Oh, okay, I'll put my money in there. And that's the way the human mind works. So you're gonna play some of that game. Okay. Um, this is a, a question from Ty. She wants to know how you handled equity for, uh, the, the smaller investments at the very beginning during the seed rain, uh, seed uh, rain level. So she's talking about like a $10,000 investment, which for some people isn't that much money, but for other people, it is a lot of money and it's, you know, your seed stage. So I know that you were able to raise a lot coming out of the gate, relatively speaking, but do you have any advice for founders who are at that seed stage raising these small amounts and trying to think about how they're going to allocate equity? Yeah, I wouldn't raise from any one check writer less than 1% of the total allowable amount in a round. So if you're, like, you're authorized to raise $3 million, generally I wouldn't, if I had it to do again, raise less than $30,000. Uh, I did because I had college roommates who were accredited investors and I, it was worth the administrative hassle. Uh, the answer is I hired a law firm. I hired Wilson Sonsini and they handled all of the paperwork, you know, taking the term sheet, turning it into a seed stage term sheet. And then in terms of the mechanics of how the money came in, and this is 2011, 2012, they either wired, I either wired the money in it to an escrow that was managed by Wilson Sonsini, or they wrote me a check and I took it in my sweaty little hand down to the Cherry Creek, you know, Wells Fargo <laughs> and cashed it. Um, so there's no secret to that. I did not use a, a platform. I did not, uh, you know, do it probably the right way that you would do it now, but that's, that's how I did it. Okay. All right. I'm just going to take one more question because we're coming up to the top of the hour. Um, I'm sorry, John, we can't get to all of your questions, but um, another question from Rob, um, what do you see for Ibotta and my apologies for mispronouncing it earlier. What do no you see for Ibotta's future um, after going public? Um, broadly speaking, I think that we will continue to build out a, a network that can kill uh, a technology like coupons. So coupons were invented in 1880 by Coca-Cola, 140 years ago. There are 191 billion of them circulating in the US still paper. 99.5% of them end up in a landfill unused cutting down at unnecessarily a million trees a month and routing through a stupid clearinghouse system that takes 12 months for brands and retailers to get their money back. This is an insane system. So I would like to completely kill that once and for all after 140 years and replace that with a purely digital, environmentally friendly solution. So what would that mean? That would mean not only having Ibotta, but powering the rewards programs of the entire consumer packaged goods industry. So whether you are redeeming a reward at Walmart or Kroger or Albertsons or Whole Foods or Amazon, 
it would all be powered in a coordinated way through a digital network that we would build. Um, that's what I aspire to achieve in the next little while. I think some people you know, view that as a small or big achievement. To me, um, you're basically taking an enormous amount of stupid and inefficient cost out of a system, and you can then give that back to people, either businesses that don't have to spend it or consumers that get better rewards and can spend that in their daily lives. So that's where we're heading. And then, you know, we want to continue to be a Denver-based company, but we're going to broaden our reach, both, you know, domestically and internationally over time, take the, the best ideas that we have. We have a new browser extension, which you can check out on Google Chrome. It's free. Um, we got a, a canvas there. It's a brand new product. There's so many ideas we want to build into that product. And it's just exciting. There's not enough hours in the day. There's not enough squads of technologists to build that stuff. So I think when you get kind of a, a view of the world and then you can sort of see two or three years worth of experiments you could run underneath the umbrella of that hypothesis, it's really cool. It's a really awesome feeling. And unlike being a lawyer, it's creating something. I used to joke that I was, I'm probably a worse lawyer than Abraham Lincoln and he's been dead for hundred plus years, right? But it basically is the same job. You know, but being a technologist, being an entrepreneur, you're building something that's only possible to build with the latest technological advances, whether it's bioscience, med medicine, or even just mobile technology, payments, commerce. That is really cool. I feel like you're advancing the state of not only your company, but the state of knowledge in the industry and in the world, which is, which is cool. It's a cool feeling to, to be able to point to an app on your phone at a cocktail party and be like, that's what I do. That is what we do. Um, whereas I used to be like, well, I'm a lawyer, but I know you know a lot of lawyers. I'm this kind of lawyer, but I'm not the kind of guy who's not a good lawyer. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm one of the good guys. It was just like exhausting. I like being able to just more clearly and succinctly say, we built this and this is the impact it's having on people's lives. And we're, we're going to keep trying to take it to, from a billion dollars in total earnings to a billion dollars a year. I mean, that would be a cool milestone if we gave away a billion dollars a year to, to consumers. So there's a lot more we want to try and achieve. Excellent. And on that note, I think we're going to wrap it up. Unless Gary, you do you have one last question for, for Brian here? You always have good questions. So I'm, I'm throwing that out to you. <laughs> no, I think it's been awesome so far. I mean, I feel like I've learned a lot. So thank you, Brian. Thanks for having me. Look, to all the Yaleys out there who, uh, who want, who have further questions, I'm brian at ibotta.com. I'm in Denver. If you ever want to know, you know, come out to Colorado, we're always looking for talent. Um, and, you know, check out our website if you're interested in our mission, if you're interested in, in the, I think, 300 people that we're hiring next year or something like that. Um, please, uh, please stay in touch and good luck. Brian, uh, thank you so much. That, that's so generous of you. And uh, we really appreciate your time this evening. I um, want to thank you for joining uh, Accelerate Yale's community this evening to share your entrepreneurial journey with us. Um, I want to thank Gary for being up at one in the morning, one to two in the morning GMT uh, from London to moderate this conversation. I'd like to thank the Yale Law School for co-sponsoring this evening's session. Uh, I want to also just uh, thank the Yale Alumni Association's shared interest groups, which made this event possible. They host the Zoom platform for us. And uh, on uh, April 22nd, we will be hosting a conversation with Dana Wagner of Impossible Foods. So please join us for that. Gary will be moderating that conversation as well. And on May 12th, uh, we're going to host a conversation with First Lab featuring two, uh, two ventures out of Yale Priori, uh, two Yale Law School entrepreneurs again. Uh, as well as uh, a Yale professor uh, who has a company, uh, Julie Dorsey, um, will be talking about mental canvas. So that's what's on the in the hopper for future events. And uh, once again, I want to thank all of our participants for joining us this evening. But most of all, thank you, Brian, for joining Accelerate Yale tonight. It was truly my pleasure. Good luck to everybody. You're, you're doing uh, the best possible thing you can do if you become an entrepreneur. And I wish you the best of luck. Okay, fantastic. All right. Good night, everybody.